guys it is a gorgeous Saturday night here in the collapse of global industrial civilization we have been out harvesting gladiolas here at bugs in a jar farm man let me get these things it is a fine evening to be a bloomer we're gonna talk about bloomers and doomers tonight uh, it, it is Saturday night, August 20th, 2022, which would have been my 39th wedding anniversary. So I'm going to buy, well, not buy, grow this big bouquet of beautiful flowers, send them out to my dear, sweet ex-wife, wherever she is. And uh, so I want to dedicate this rant. We're going to dedicate this rant to brothers Tyler and Roy who have uh, <laughs> taught me some valuable lessons about the will to survive. We're going to be talking about the will to survive and other such topics. So, what I was going to do tonight, uh, I was going to talk about flash mobs and Mad Max and stuff like that. Uh, I just don't have the energy for it. And I was going to do this rant. was actually going to be my Sunday sermon for tomorrow. But I'm going to be so slammed working on this tiny house. And uh, I just was in the mood to do this today. So, here with this beautiful bunch of blooms to light our way. Uh, we're going to hear, we're going to go over to those little lefties at Common Dreams. And uh, Brother Tyler sent me this, uh, although I had al already seen it over there. These little lefties, every once in a while, the little lefties come through, and this is uh, this long essay by this woman named uh, Elizabeth West. Uh, who I have done uh, Sunday sermons by Elizabeth West. I'm hoping Elizabeth, I don't think she was the one who gave me a copyright strike. Uh, Elizabeth, if that's you, but I think that was another Elizabeth that I have her confused with. But anyway, haven't checked in with Elizabeth in a while, but she has knocked it out of the park uh, I guess borrowing somewhat from our old buddy Roy Scranton with her new essay titled Learning How to Die, Finding Meaning in the Midst of Collapse. Yes, I find meaning out in my gladiola garden is where I find meaning in the midst of collapse and I'm sure Elizabeth would approve. This is a long piece, guys. I highly advise you to turn me off and read this yourself, but if it's just a Sunday morning wherever you are, I'll be glad to sit here and read it for you. I'm going to I'm going to slog on through this whole thing cuz I can't really figure out a good place to uh to cut it off. So you decide whether Elizabeth <coughs> is suffering from hopium or not. Uh, but anyway, no further ado, let's hear Elizabeth West talking about learning how to die, finding meaning in the midst of collapse. Take it away, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Despite the d extremely disheartening developments across the spectrum of worldly life, Despair and defeat are, while understandable, not inevitable. That is the good news. We are never obliged to surrender the best of our humanity, even as things around us devolve. But, in order to find our footing, it is important to begin by seeing the current reality without fear or illusion. 
we can be fairly certain that the tipping points have now tipped that we are in for an epic unraveling. I think it's Deb Ozarka who calls the 2020s the decade of the great unraveling. The planet is on fire and underwater. Plagues are on the loose. Croplands are becoming barren. Rivers going dry. Further, the shreds of sane governance that might have kept us afloat a little longer are going down in flames. The omnicidal fascist waiting impatiently in the wings for their moment on center stage are almost certain to speed us ever more swiftly toward the end of life as we have known it. Personally, I believe in miracles. Hmm. Personally, I believe in miracles because I have seen a couple in my day. I never rule them out entirely, and my fingers are crossed that we will get lucky. <laughs> However, only a fool would count on divine intervention, particularly after we repeatedly and decisively failed to heed all the wisdom so generously handed to us, such that we might save ourselves. <coughs> it is a good time then to start learning how to die. Maybe you won't need to leave life as an individual right now. Maybe you can find a way to secure the futures of your loved ones, your kids and grandkids, but we all live together on a dying planet and we are assuredly going to witness continued decline and demise on many fronts. If we tell ourselves the truth, we know that things will never go back to normal. That vain hope, often built on dreams of technological solutions to climate collapse or a political messiah emerging from nowhere to make us all sane again, may be comforting. I would never suggest that we turn away from the things that help us get through the day. God knows it is getting harder and harder to do and we need all the tools we can gather. But I also believe that this is a moment. Looking at death in the eye as it barrels towards us when courage and a commitment to digging deep, whatever that means to each of us, is paramount. Thirty-five years ago, a beloved and too young friend succumbed to an especially aggressive cancer after, after what he often referred to as a, quote, long and valiant fight. He and his doctors left virtually no allopathic stone unturned, and I spent many months on and off by his side at Massachusetts General Hospital supporting him as he prepared for or recovered from well-intended but barbarous intervention after another. In the end, the cancer took him. He maintained an absolute allegiance throughout to the notion that he would survive with an impressive store of personal will, a hefty amount of denial, and best standard of care. He kept the fire lit under that belief up until about 20 hours before he passed. I think he must have felt that any admission of mortality would have given the errant cells an opening. <clears throat> The afternoon before his death, it look, he looked at me through a heavy morphine and brain lesion-induced fog 
he looked at me as if struggling to understand something as baffling as the world we all look out upon today and said with horror and disbelief, I'm going to die? Within hours, he was unconscious, and soon after that, he left his body. This is an ancient episode in my story. I recount it because I feel a resonance with our current and multivalent predicament, and because it points towards an opportunity that I and we missed at a cost. Brad clung, clung to his life as full of pain and fear as it was. He wanted to go on and wanted to find the workarounds that would make up for all he had lost. There were many things he longed to accomplish and experience. He was not prepared to die. He was not willing to die. This is the case for most of us. We want more, and we have purpose, work to do, change to make, books to read and write, music to play, love to love, kids to raise. Well, some of us have kids to raise. Mountains to climb and seas to sail. We are not, most of us, ready to lie down and concede defeat. But in everyone's personal life, and now in the life of the earth, there comes a point when a convergence of natural forces relays the message that we are no longer the master of our physical fate, which, which is inherently terrifying. So we rely on a variety of strategies to navigate the journey toward possible personal and global extinction. Some cling to her. Some cling to hope like an overturned life raft on the open ocean. Others fight like hell for the just world they want to live in. And a lot of us, like my best like my friend Brad, default to thoughts often relatively unconscious of getting back to normal. And so put one foot in front of the other, moving inexorably toward the abyss, blindfolded and yet distracted by visions of happier times. The truth is that most of us have no idea what to do and are simply trying to keep the flood of rising panic from drowning us altogether. Huh. Huh. Hope and anger can be cathartic, galvanizing. They make us feel like agents in this time of decline. When it is apparent that our season of dominion is at an end, if we survey the situation with clear eyes, openings to accomplish anything substantive are few. Electric vehicle? Sure. Eat local? Why not? Recycle? Nice try, but no, not really. Get out on the streets? Yes. But does anyone in power care? And that newly passed and much heralded climate bill? Sadly, likely too little, too late. Of course, these are all good things, but a reality check will reveal how hollow they are if our goal is to turn this ship around. Still, it is natural to reach for anything for anything, uh, yes, that conveys a little agency that allows us to take part 
Who wants to feel like an odd bit of flotsam or jetsam at the mercy of forces completely beyond our control? Who wants to sit by and watch helplessly as the whole world goes to hell in a handbasket? Anger and ho anger and hope are strategies a lot of us reach for. It may be hard to swallow, but the position of minds far better than mine, such as Roy Scranton, Chris Hedges, and Noam Chomsky, to name just a few, is that we have likely crossed several thresholds. We are now primarily in the realm of palliative measures. I continue to bow with profound respect to the activists who are using their lives, possibly their last breaths, to defend pieces of this beautiful planet and the various worthy species, including our own, <clears throat> to soften suffering or to call for justice. But I no longer hold out hope. I no longer hold out hope for any sweeping worldly victories. And with that recognition, I find myself asking, what is my role? How can I do this well? How do I find meaningful direction in the midst of this often frightening process of dissolution? I am not alone in asking these questions, I know. We humans, we humans are very good at building and expanding, like one tiny house isn't enough, so I've got to build a second tiny house, the second tiny house isn't going to be enough, then I'm going to build a third tiny house, probably get up here next summer, three tiny houses won't be enough, so I'm going to build a fourth tiny house, I guess. Anyway. We humans are very good at building and expanding. We, at least in the Western devoured capitalism dominated world, which now includes most of us, adore bigger and better. Like I'm building a bigger tiny house. You know, I love it. You know, my tiny house is too tiny, so I need a bigger tiny house. Yes. Most of us adore bigger and better. Therein lies our accustomed meaning. We love, well, speak for yourself, darling. We love the miracle of birth. We rejoice in creation. We are drawn toward becoming larger, extending our reach. This seems to apply even when our creations are works that engender equality or beauty or understanding, becoming smaller and less influential, losing and dying, declining and letting go. These are not things we tend to aspire to or even try very hard to understand. And that presents a real problem. Here we are living in the very heart of a trajectory that conflicts in a fundamental way with our culturally inculcated values, with the prevailing principle and ethos of our time and place. Capitalism. Many have warned that unrestrained growth is incompatible with enduring life on this planet, but we failed to take this to heart. We did not upend the giant globe-strangling machine that spews toxins and death for profit soon enough. Now we are immersed up to our necks in the fall while we have learned to worship only the ascent. Most of us know absolutely nothing 
about how to become weak or to die with dignity or grace or gratitude and joy. We have probably never seen it done well and we have so very few role models. In fact, we often put those who know something about loss, our elders and homeless for instance, out of sight, ashamed either by their frailty and bad fortune or by our own lack of compassion for them. Growing old and moving toward death is a developmental phase we have not devoted much energy or attention to in Western culture. We tend to look upon it as nothing more than an end to all that was worthwhile in our prime, and so it is with the decline and death of a civilization and potentially all life on this planet. I want to know, is it possible to find beauty? Is it possible to find beauty? Yes, uh, <laughs> and value in this decline. Is there any kind of personal expansion that can occur while the structures that have upheld us crumble? Are there boons we can discern even as the gifts of youth and endless growth are stripped away as the ease of life lessens? What gold can we unearth in this era of loss? We know that dead trees in the forest nourish the miraculous mycelium, but we have yet to celebrate the slow death of a tree from drought or pest or fire damage or old age. Many people I know swear they are unafraid of being dead. It is just getting there that worries them. Is it possible to attune ourselves to nature whose rhythms are impeccable such that we reject no part of our journey? Brad was a bright young man, and yet he could not look at or live what so undeniably was happening to him. He held on and fought that valiant fight until he lost it. Because he was so determined to have a post-cancer future, he never seized the moments he actually had. He did not pursue the conversations I know he wanted to have. He postponed his dream of touring France and dining at La Pyramide in favor of paying off his student loans. He put all his eggs in the basket of a healthy life after things get back to normal. He was an autodidact, yet he turned away from the one window he had to learn how to die. Death came while his attention was riveted by the possibility of survival, and it took him. As I ponder how to live purposefully on a planet that is currently passing through the portal, environmentally, politically, economically, I find myself thinking of another good friend whose death I attended many years after Brad's. I met Yun Su when she was 83 and dying from metastatic melanoma. The scope of her vibrant physical life, which could easily fill a thousand pages, had narrowed considerably, but her mind was at its peak and her spirit in its glory. She confide, confided in me soon after we met that she had just apart embarked upon the most thrilling adventure of her lifetime. She said, to be able to observe and to participate in the process of dying with full consciousness outshines any explorations I have ever undertaken. I watch with anticipation and excitement to see how this unfolds, 
how I respond, who I really am as I lose control of my life. Yun Su had a long run, unlike Brad, as well as the benefit of wisdom accrued over the decades. Her approach to dying, courage, curiosity, a willingness to be present to whatever life brought on the road to death was a revelation. She inspires me, as does Brad. I don't want to miss this incredible moment in time and in my life simply because it frightens me. Do you ever wonder how it is that you ended up here at this very instant when things are exploding, imploding, rotting on every front? Could it be a privilege to be alive and awake in 2022? To be a witness and a participant almost inevitably impacted by fire and flood and fascism? Is there an inherent challenge here that, if taken up, could lead you to a vaster and more magnificent expression of your own life? Perhaps this feels counterintuitive, paradoxical, likely so, but it might be worth considering. I know that I need to learn how to die, both as an individual human being and as part of this grand experiment, which appears to be wrapping up. I need to show up for this chapter just as I did for the years of creating and nurturing those creations. It, is because, it has been my good fortune to know a few people who accompany the dying through their work with hospice. I look to them for guidance as I continue to try to make sense of this increasingly terminal world <clears throat> to help answer my queries about how to live meaningfully. Their courage, willingness to sit with the entire gamut of emotion without pushing anything away, acceptance of decline and loss as natural parts of life, honesty tempered with compassion, intentional offering of an open heart, these help me to shape my understanding of how to be a good human both to myself and others in these upcoming minutes, days, years. Of course, there is grief and anger when we contemplate the loss, the suffering, and it all must be honored. But if these are allowed to overtake us, if despair and hopelessness are <clears throat> left to eclipse all else, then we may miss our opportunity to prize from this process all it has to offer to transcend our ego's addiction to survival at all cost, to become who we always believed we could be, to live as if each breath and each thought and each word matters, we may miss the only chance we have to learn to die well. It is unlikely we will change outcomes on the planet by living and loving as if we were almost out of time, but surely we can change ourselves and those we touch we can choose to have the conversations that we fear but deeply want to have. We can give away what we don't need today instead of saving it for some imaginary future. We can stop to appreciate the weeds that grow up through the cracks in the sidewalk, thank the birds that somehow continue to nest and breed, Send love to the insects who soldier on to our great benefit. We can pause to, we can, 
pause to honor the fish and the polar bears and the people who perish, we can look for ways to twine the grief and pain with gratitude that we are alive and able to feel so deeply, even when it hurts, even when we know that all we love will not last. Time may not be long for many of us, so perhaps dive into that gratitude for that which has been easy and good and beautiful and for that which asks us to become so much more than we ever imagined was possible. We have a huge privilege, however, the window to embrace it is not wide. There you go, we have a rapidly closing window. Yes, there are many whose lives have been or will soon be consumed by desperate pursuit of survival. If yours, meaning your life, is still mostly in your hands, then please don't waste this narrow and spectacular opportunity. Even as you attend to the mundane, using whatever tools you need to stay afloat, go ahead and learn how to die. Start by the taking the radical step of showing up, heart open to all that is, even and especially when so much is dying around you. Resist the instinct to flee fight or freeze. This is not about surviving. It is about living while the world we have known dies. And then explore what this segment of the journey can mean and hold for you. Look at what you are able to receive from this dying planet and what gifts you have to share with it. Don't be afraid. There is literally nothing to lose other than the opportunity to be present. If you want company on the road, it is out there. Some of us will make our way alone. No one knows the right way or holds the patent on how to navigate something this big and uncharted. No one can tell you how to live while we die. We are all finding our way alone and together in this unprecedented collective project. But please don't miss out. It could be that this is the most brilliant and meaningful time of your life. As my friend Yun Su affirmed, this is the time to find out who you really are. Remember, no matter how dire things become, no one can force us to surrender our right to love nature, one another, ourselves, and to be loved. These will always be ours to choose. And there you go. So who is Elizabeth West? Elizabeth West has a lifelong interest in revolution and exploring the interstices where love, truth, imagination, and courage meet, sometimes igniting wild transformation. Her political writing has appeared in counterpunch and dissident voice. And she has her own website, which you can track down through the link that I'm going to put here. Anyway, amen, Sister Elizabeth. So we have already had our Sunday sermon on this exciting Saturday night. And with that, uh, I can wrap up. That was a long way of saying, in case you didn't figure this out, that was a very long way of saying get out there and enjoy it while you still can and grab all of the gladiolas that you can on your way out. My guys, 
Okay, little dog. He managed not to knock the gladiolas over. <laughs> you know, these things, these bulbs were like 15 cents a piece. I mean, this entire bouquet here is about $2 worth of, uh, of bulbs. These are actually very easy to grow. Deer don't eat them. No pests eat them. Anyway, get out there and enjoy your gladiolas while you still can. Bye, guys.